Thanks for coming back to another episode of Pitch It, a fintech conversation amongst founders, investors, and friends. I'm your host, Todd Anderson, Chief Content Officer at Fintech Nexus. And what we do is we take a peek behind the curtain. What motivates someone to start a company? How do investors make the right bet? What do accelerators do during and, and help enabling the process of, of growing your company? How do banks think of founders? Not to mention, we try to have some fun. And, and what you'll see is we'll also do some special episodes. We have some new features coming. So stick with us and you'll get all you'll need to know about the fintech startup landscape. Pitch It is really a, a part of a larger podcast network here at Fintech Nexus. You can go to my colleague Peter, our co-founder and chairman for Fintech One on One. You can subscribe to his feed. Or we have our newest podcast by one of our writers, Isabel Castro, The Fintech Coffee Break. For everything produced by Fintech Nexus, you can check out Fintech Nexus Podcast, which is really our content fire hose. All shows, webinar replays, even in-person event content, not to mention our weekly news show. As always, we hope that you rate the show and write a review. I take try to really take listener feedback seriously and it, as it helps make the show better. You can also follow the podcast and all of our podcasts on the feed of your choice, whether it be Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to listen, or come directly to news.fintechnexus.com. Now, let's get on with the show. On the latest episode of The Pod, I'm joined by Patrick Sells, co-founder of True Digital. True Digital's mission is to help financial institutions embrace digital innovation through investments in culture, capabilities, and capital. And, you know, it really is the mission for Patrick and the team at True Digital. Over the last few years, he's had the chance to speak with 1,100 financial institutions across the U.S. And these are FIs of, of all sizes, all shapes. Um, and so you can say he has the pulse of what's going on uh, in the banking community. Patrick and I talked about, you know, what were some of the common themes that came out of those conversations? What are the biggest barriers that banks still face today when it comes to moving the needle on digital innovation and innovation overall? The education gap amongst banks and fintechs and kind of how those two uh, come together and pair together. Mind shift and, and what that product is. Blockchain and crypto, as Patrick spent a lot of time uh, talking with banks, um, you know, during his time uh, as a member of the NYDIG team, raising capital and much, much more. A couple of quick PSAs uh, before we get to the episode. First, we have our May uh, event coming up, Fintech Nexus USA. Um, as a startup community, uh, we do have special pricing for startups, so just check out fintechnexus.com. Also, check out Pitch It, obviously the same name as, as our podcast here. Uh, the Pitch It competition is for early stage companies that have raised up to or less than $30 million in equity. Um, it's free to apply, and finalists get free tickets to the event. So please uh, make sure you apply um, and uh, look at our website for startup pricing. Um, also, if you want to sponsor an episode, come on as a guest or sponsor one of our many digital or in-person offerings, you can go ahead and reach out to me anytime. It's Todd, T-O-D-D, at fintechconnexus.com. Now, without further ado, I present Patrick Sells, co-founder of True Digital. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Patrick, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Todd. I'm excited to be on with you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So uh, give everyone a, a, just a, a little bit of background about yourself and, um, you know, kind of what brought you ultimately to the point of, uh, you know, starting your new venture. Sure. So I, uh, in college, started a digital marketing agency and was really focused on helping companies adopt new technology, whether that was e-commerce or social media, as they wanted to grow and worked in just about every industry but banking. 
And then I met a uh, community bank in New York, Quantic, that had uh, their CEO, Steve, and I had become friends and had a vision for, hey, what if we could take this one branch community bank and turn it into a digital bank? And so said yes and uh, went to New York. And it was my first time working at a bank or really knowing anything about banking and very quickly realized uh, that turning this into a digital bank was going to be very challenging. You know, ran into many of the issues that the industry knows about, you know, the, the notion of cores and legacy infrastructure, not having developers on staff, more, you know, vendor management and networking was what was a shock to me um, at the time. But, you know, spent a couple of years there successfully doing that with Quantic and learned a lot. I think, it, you know, while it was very difficult, a lot of the, the struggles we felt with, we dealt with, we probably at the time thought it was because we were small and starting from zero. And in that process, you know, one of the products that we uh, were the first bank to launch was a Bitcoin rewards debit card. And our partner for that was NYDIG. And so went over to NYDIG and said, okay, now can we do that for the whole industry? And, you know, NYDIG was an awesome journey and got to work with all of the major, you know, uh, legacy providers, the cores, the online banking providers, payment companies and talk to just under 1100 financial institutions in two years. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, what I realized after all of that was those struggles we dealt with at Quantic weren't unique to us. Uh, they many of those same themes existed for the entire industry. And so I think kind of having that perspective said, okay, well, what could I do about it? And instead of, you know, trying to build a company with a new feature or a new widget, if you will, for an FI, let's build something that tried to reduce the friction that exists between financial institutions and, and technology vendors. And so that was the basis for now today's company, which is called True Digital. And so it sounds, you know, um, you mentioned you started a company uh, in college. Uh, you obviously have your own venture now. Being a founder and entrepreneur was kind of something that's that's always been a part of you, even though you went through these other journeys, it felt like you'd eventually get to the point of starting your own venture again anyway. You know, since day one, uh, I grew up poor. And so the, you know, the idea of like, I got to go make money oftentimes meant, you know, you were doing something as an entrepreneur and that's probably hardwired in my DNA uh, now looking back and actually have started several different things, a, a predicted data business, uh, started a, a charity with Drew Brees. Uh, we raised and gave away about $30 million. Um, and then, you know, at, at Quantic and NYDIG, still very much felt entrepreneurial. It was how do you, in that case, take something that was existing and build it into something new from a product and vertical standpoint, but inside of, you know, an infrastructure but yes, very much an entrepreneur and excited to be back to kind of the, the pure the new stage startup world again. So tell us uh, exactly what you guys are doing uh, at True Digital and um, how'd you eventually get to the name, which seems obvious uh, in, in the, you know, the sound of it. But, you know, was that always obvious to you guys in terms of, you know, coming up with a, a company name? So the name True Digital actually uh, was first conceived about three or four years ago when I was working at Quantic and was getting to talk to a lot of different community banks and realized that there was, I felt like some tension around with all the conversation around FinTech and, and digital was this belief that maybe banks should get rid of branches and go fully digital. And that caused tension, uh, rightfully so. But the idea was, look, technology is emerging all around us and every aspect of our lives. And I think the thing any business needs to do, including this industry, is say, how can we harness that technology for the betterment of our employees and of our communities and our, and our customers? And so kind of the, the origin of the name was discovering what your true digital identity is or should be as a, as a bank uh, and how can you incorporate technology accordingly from the business of what we're doing, uh, it's as I mentioned, it's about re trying to reduce that friction that exists. And I think 
you know, use an analogy of a Hot Wheels track. If you can remember those as kids with the little boosters that sped the cars up, <laughs> we're really just trying to be a booster. We're not trying to be consultants. We're not trying to tell you what you should do or where you should go. One, there's a lot of great consulting companies out there uh, that can help you do that. And I think, you know, the exposure of talking to all of those FIs generally feel like many financial institutions probably know at least part of where they need to go to innovate. It's just, again, so dang hard. Um, and so in particular, what we've built is a technology platform that will go live in a couple of months <clears throat> that helps bankers uh, more natively understand the world of tech vendors. And, and so here, not just like the, the consumer facing tech, but it could be back office tech, compliance tech, you know, really any part of the, the vendor stack um, in a way that's native to them. And so what we try to do from a data standpoint is present, you know, information where that lets bankers know who to ask, what to ask, and when to ask uh, when it comes to the vendors that they work with. You mentioned in your, your open talking to 11,000 uh, FIs. 1,100. 1,100, sorry. <laughs> 11,000 would be even more impressive. Um, <laughs> the um, you know, through through those conversations was there i mean is there a number of themes that kind of that hang up banks when it comes to digital transformation is part of it that there's not enough buy in within the executive that you know that that funnels down through the team has there been um you know some progress on that that most banks know now that you know digital and uh, a version of digital or what their version of true digital might be needs to happen it's just a matter of when what are some of the impediments that banks still face so you know it's multifaceted depending on where they are in the journey but i think for example a pain point heard from many is and we were asked this at night dig but i know it's true outside of us is okay i've just met this fintech at a conference or they've pitched me or i've heard about them but who else is like them? And today, the only way I can really discover that is likely to go to Google and try to figure out, okay, I know you do this one thing. And so this other company, is it also like you? And so how do I even know who I should be talking to? Uh, maybe it was the first one you met. Maybe it's, you know, it's more than that. There's another kind of pain point where you know, banks need to speak to references from a third party uh, diligence standpoint, but there's also a ton of value there because of the, you know, the inherent nature of the complicated legacy stacks that FIs have. Okay, how did you make this work or how did that aspect work? And oftentimes, you know, you're asking FinTech for references, but those references they give you, holding aside the fact they're probably the most vocal champions, yeah. uh, and that, I don't think that's a negative thing necessarily, it's that oftentimes those references look nothing like you. And so, you know, I dealt with this at, at Quantic, looking to talk to, a, you know, a vendor, okay, great, if someone was on a different core, they weren't really all that helpful to my op staff. And so how do I more easily find the, the you know, bank or the credit union that is most like me, that my ops team can speak to, my compliance team can speak to, and I think that's one of the things, for example, that can really slow down, you know, these relationships is I may be as a chief innovation officer of a bank or a digital banking person have a probably a greater awareness of other banks and that are doing innovative things and just know more people. And so I can tap into that community, but my bank op staff or my compliance staff doesn't have that same network. And so for them to get familiar and comfortable, it's a lot easier if they can talk to a peer, right? And today they're kind of left in the dark, more or less, trying to figure out who is this and what are the risks and how would it work? And so trying to help in that way, I think kind of the, the third one I'd give you as an example, we can, we can talk about more of these is you oftentimes when you're talking to a FinTech don't understand what the real implications from the risk profile is of that vendor. Um, and so you do online account opening, awesome. Uh, but does the vendor know to say, well, we use the non-documentation method of CIP 
in our process or we use the documentation method of CIP. Yeah. And those questions are all, often are not surfaced early on. And so you get three, four months down the, 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 the road, you really like this one vendor, then you realize, oh, we're never gonna be okay from a risk and compliance standpoint here. And the efforts stop, you know, killed. At that point, there's not another horse in the race and no one wants to start the process all over again after having just spent four months. And so yeah. it just kind of dies and you, you get this feeling of inertia inside of uh, the FI. So those are examples of some of the pain points we're helping solve. What about on the uh, the fintech side? Uh, are fintechs, is their knowledge of different size of bank, uh, difference between a bank and a credit union and how they might approach those types of uh, you know, FIs, like, is there an education gap also on the fintech side that, that maybe plays into some of this mismatching or inertia, uh, and, you know, is, is part of what you guys looking to do? Does it also play with the, uh, the fintech education side? Yeah. So, so definitely, I think uh, that's true on the fintech side and there's a help there that is needed. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, the fintech salespeople, you know, they know a digital banking person again, or it could be a lending person, you know, whatever they have a primary contact, but oftentimes their relationships at any one of their FI customers doesn't extend to that many different people and that many different functions. Yeah. And so they can't really help you get connected to the right people necessarily. Um, and I think, you know, the education for the fintechs, you know, definitely needs to happen and, you know, from our perspective, we are exclusively looking to serve banks and credit unions. And so we're not as focused on the fintech piece of it. You know, I know there's other players out there, like the ICBA runs a great incubator, for example, that helps fintechs learn more about banking. So different, different players, you know, do different things. We're really trying to like be the translator for the FI. So Got it. Here's, another, here's another example of something I heard often. I did about 200 board presentations uh, over the last two years around Bitcoin and crypto and what is it. And in many of those conversations, what I discovered was the board members were very interested in, in wanting to learn more and be supportive, but they just didn't understand how to think about FinTech, even someone like us, in light of what the bank's strategic plan was. They know the bank is trying to grow non-interest income or they're trying to you know, improve their not net interest margin. Yeah. But how do I translate that to a FinTech? And so if you can now say, look, you can take these banker concepts and metrics, these strategies, and use that as a way to then search and understand who's out there, you've solved a massive gap. And now it's, okay, great. Here, let's go talk to these vendors, right? And so that's another one of the things we're doing is kind of giving that that translation layer for bankers. When doing a little bit of research for the episode, I see that you know you have something um, that you've launched called MindShift. What is kind of the thinking behind that? And tell us a little bit more about that. So, <clears throat> pulling on that example again of the the board presentations. A lot of times when they would start, there was a sense of, why are we talking about crypto? <laughs> We're a bank. <laughs> and yeah. as you know, definitely some you know negative sentiments at times. What I found though was it wasn't that those beliefs about crypto or Bitcoin were about Bitcoin or crypto itself. It was really rooted from I don't understand it. And we all resist typically things we don't understand uh, because that is scary and so when you explained it though in a way that they could understand then all of a sudden the ability to participate and engage was radically different um, and so one of the things we're trying to do with MindShift is help make emerging technology and technology more understandable at, at like the tech level and then as well at the compliance level so that the, the ability to move forward is there you know, banks don't have a lot of uh, education around tech 101. Whereas if you live in the tech world, you just, you understand it much better and like how the technology works and how it could work and how it could be used. I think the, the other example is 
that one of the benefits of this industry is most people have spent the majority of their careers working in this industry. Uh, that, again, that a lot of positives. One of the downsides, though, I think from an innovation standpoint is that means too often we're all working from the same set of assumptions yeah. and we don't have disparate mindsets. And the, the most powerful innovation comes by when those fundamental assumptions are challenged or thought of differently because it rearranges everything. And so how do we help kind of challenge and illuminate some assumptions and how do we help give the education and the understanding about then some of the, the new technology to ultimately help shift the mindset? You know, the journey of banks and fintechs working together is is kind of it's come pretty far. Um, you know, the last uh, you know five or six years, initially fintechs burst on the scene. We're going to take over banks. We're gonna uh, we're gonna take their lunch and and whatnot. And they quickly realized, or at least somewhat quickly realized, that that wasn't the case. But you know, we have a looming recession uh, that we're constantly hearing about. Do you see any risk in in kind of the recession potentially hurting the progress made um, and does innovation in all these conversations that you've had over the years, does innovation end up taking a back seat when we change different environments and go into a recession versus maybe a, a, a time of robust growth uh, of the last few years uh, and how do you help, you know, kind of the FIs in that journey when you enter this type of period? So two different answers to that question. The first about kind of how to, how I'm thinking at least about what's going on vis-a-vis mm -hmm. innovation and in the industry. I think whenever there are major external uh, environmental changes, that is a oftentimes a, a spark or a catalyst for innovation. We went through, you know, the pandemic and all of a sudden we all learned very quickly how to use things like Zoom and work in a different way. And, and I look yeah. at it as positives. I think here, you know, in the challenging environment that we're facing and likely ahead of us, it again says, okay, I need to do things differently. And so that then makes me more likely to actually, I think, look at technology and be more open to, okay, can this help me save money? Can this help me grow faster? Can this make me more efficient? When the fundamentals of the business is in a really strong period, there's actually a disincentive because I just want to maximize everything that I've been doing that's making me money today. And so I, I tend to think actually there's, that's really a tailwind uh, for the industry in the next couple of years. From our standpoint, you know, our, our product or the platform we've built is designed to be very cheap to begin with because uh, we really wanted to solve a problem for as many FIs as we could. Um, and the other side of it is what I'm working on something I call the talk about the hidden cost of innovation. And so, you know, at a bank or a credit union, because you don't have the information about who, what, and when to ask, you spend a lot of time in demos and diligence and researching and talking to fintechs. And then that cost doesn't show up as clearly on your P and L yeah. as, you know, the vendor expense, but it's many, many, many hundreds of man hours out of a successful technology partnership. And if you can now present that information in a way that is more easily acted on, you also can recoup a tremendous amount of the human resources, which is oftentimes the, you know, the biggest expense line item for any uh, business. You, with all the time that you've spent talking to FIs um, about Bitcoin and, um, you know, the, the last couple of years, uh, has your mind or, or has anything shifted in how you view uh, the crypto, um, you know, the crypto markets and, and ultimately how uh, FIs can integrate either blockchain based or crypto related products with what's gone on the, the last six months or so? I, I still every day get at least a couple of calls from banks uh, asking about crypto, uh, you know, questions or what's going on an area I really do enjoy talking about. I think, you know, the, the technology of blockchain is powerful and it is going to disrupt in a positive way uh, many different industries, I think, especially the financial services world. Uh, again, though, I think it's in a positive way. 
And I think more and more banks and, and credit unions are spending time and energy here. I think what we saw is oftentimes with any new tech, you then have people experimenting with it and other ways just trying to wrap their heads around it. Some of that experimentation was, I think, in, with good purposes. Some of it, it was really a joke. You know, we all know the example of like Dogecoin as an example. It was just meant to be a joke. Uh, and then you have people who are, are, you know, bad intentions or negative intentions, you know, trying to figure out, hey, could I use this to make a quick buck? Um, but I, that's where I go back to, like, if we remember when we first got our iPhones, there were apps, you know, for 99 cents that would give me a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> was that worth 99 cents? No. Is an NFT worth what it is today? Probably not. But it was the beginnings of how we were all the, we were coming to understand the technology and not Uber super awesome and powerful yeah. on my phone, right? But, and I think NFTs point to how smart contracts can be radically powerful. It's just the initial use case oftentimes is probably sillier than not kind of like the flashlight app on our phones. You know, you've had um, various ventures um, over your your career thus far. Um, you know, kind of is there a a common lesson um, you know for other founders that that might pick up the episode that you found is is beneficial, whether it's when you started your marketing agency or some of the the um, data stuff you've done, or even to your current venture. Um, you know, that, that you might be able to, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, for maybe the, the founder that might just be starting their company today. Sure. Um, I grew up in, a, a conservative Midwest, generally in a, in a, in a, in a Christian, um, uh, environment. And one of the things that I still remember to this day, hearing as a teenager was about a story of some missionaries who'd gone to Africa and, they would show up there and say, look, meet Jesus. And no one cared because they were starving. And when all of a sudden you said, here's the, here's, you want food? Now let me tell you about Jesus. People sat down and had the conversation. This is not to talk anything about religion, but it was a powerful illustration of, yeah. I think I have an answer for you. And if I just try to tell you that, oftentimes you don't give a shit. If I take the time to care about what do you need and you understand that I know that and I care about that, then you're really interested in what I think I have that could also help you. And similarly, you see how that plays out with even what we're doing with like True Digital. Hey, FinTechs, yes, you have this great technology to offer, but you're kind of like jumping past the point of the, I need food. How do I understand you? How do I make sure I know I should be talking to you or who, and if you can help do that part, actually understand the banks, then I think you'll have a much more productive conversation. But that idea is, I think, true for all entrepreneurs, which is the slow down on the what I can do for you. Let me understand you so you feel that and then move forward. Uh, best piece of advice or, or a piece of advice that you've received uh, on your journey um, that maybe you could share? Uh, it's a good question. I think you know, one of the things on us uh, is that business is a learning competition. Uh, and what we want to do is be able to learn faster and better than our competitors. Uh, that's how you win. Uh, and so I think of that advice, even one, I oftentimes have sought as much advice as possible, but that piece of advice that someone gave me is pretty powerful to, to, in terms of how to think about whether you're a startup or you're a bank or you're any company, understand that it's around how your team and you can continue to learn more efficiently and learn more than your competitors. That is ultimately the advantage. Uh, how big... Um is the team today, uh, who are some of the people that, that you're working with, um, you know, at true digital today, we have about 10 people on the team. Um, I partnered with someone named Ryan Alfred. Uh, we had gotten to work together at NIDIG. He also is a serial entrepreneur and had started three or four other businesses. What's been fun for us in this stage in the journey 
is of those 10 people, everyone has worked with us at least once before and on average at almost 2.7 different companies. And so being able to pull a team together of, hey, we all know each other, I know you, just the speed of which you can execute and operate is very different than when we, you know, we think about those first co companies and how hard that part of it is. Uh, and so 10 people, all people who know each other and work together um, uh, across engineering, design, marketing, product, partnerships, legal and finance. So really the, all the kind of the, the function, the main functions of the business. Uh, I'm not sure if you've raised investor capital yet, but um, if talking to investors kind of, um, you know, how's that been? And ultimately, um, you know, what do you learn about your company when you go through the the fundraising process? If if uh, someone's going on that that journey right now, talking to investors, uh, you know, so I, I had never raised money before, and NIDIG was part of helping raise, you know, over a billion dollars of equity, and so got uh, a lot of experience raising money <laughs> uh, very quickly. Uh, at True Digital, we haven't raised. Um, many money at this point, uh, besides Ryan and I, um, you know, I think when you go through that process of raising money, you learn a couple of key things or a couple of things that really stood out to me, which is the ultimately how I set up the risk reward between myself and an investor is very important. And to not try to skew that one way or the other, it doesn't work. You really do need sober, honest, I'm taking this risk, I'm getting this reward that needs to be shared, needs to be transparent, and that then allows for the alignment of interest. Um, I think the other part of it is thinking about, okay, what am I wanting to accomplish? What do I need to accomplish with this money that I'm going to raise? And how will that allow me to be to create more value after or will I be able to scale the value I've created but think of thinking about it in terms of the value creation I think that also helps you understand then the valuations you should be at and the, and the right metrics um, and you'll learn sometimes and, and probably in good ways that other people don't think you understand the risk and reward in the right way and that the <laughs> value you think you can you can create isn't what they think and that's an awesome signal. Again, going back to like the learning uh, an analogy or piece of advice, you want to learn all that and as much of that feedback as possible because it could help you then realize some of your assumptions are wrong, yeah. right? Maybe not, but that's not, not a bad thing at all to find somebody who has a different viewpoint on what you're doing. Uh, so we have just a couple minutes left. I usually like to end a little bit lighter than uh, we've started. So uh, do you have a, a favorite book or the last book that you read? Probably the best book I've read as an entrepreneur is called The E-Myth by uh, Michael Gerber. Really helped me understand kind of the fundamentals of how to think about the role I need to play as an entrepreneur and my team and, and recommend that to people. Uh Another book that I really enjoyed personally is called uh, When Breath Becomes Air. It's about a you know, world-class neurosurgeon, trauma surgeon. So oftentimes when people have been in accidents and how, you know, he, what to do if, okay, this person may never move again or may never be conscious again. And how do you deal with that and, and his role as a surgeon? And uh, it's an autobiography and he also ends up, uh, he gets married and has, uh, is, is pregnant and then he gets stage four cancer. And so you, you hear this wow. beautiful insight into uh, life in a really deep way as he's wrestling through it all. And so those two books, personally and professionally, are ones I, I typically like to recommend to people. You know, founders always need something to... Uh, kind of get their mind off things so they don't burn themselves out. What do you do to unwind? How do you stay stay focused, stay fresh? Uh, definitely, that is that's something that everyone struggles with, founder or not, is the, <laughs> the feeling of a burnout. Uh, I really enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles. Uh, most mornings, if I'm at home, and most evenings, I work on uh, puzzles, and I like to you know go running, 
and uh, shopping. Those are kind of my three hobbies that I try to keep in my life to stay balanced. Uh, do you watch sports? Uh, do you have a favorite team or teams that you root for? Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I've gotten the opportunity to work with Drew Brees for several years and so kind of became a New Orleans Saints uh, fan, even though he's no longer there. Uh, you know, that'd probably be my default team today. Don't watch a lot of sports. I like to follow it in the news, uh, but tend to stay pretty. How'd, pretty you, get, how'd you get with together work. with Drew Brees? Uh, that, that that's a story for a whole a whole other <laughs> podcast. Uh, but you know, we, we worked on a charity together called the Super Service Challenge, and uh, just had had a lot of fun with it for about four or five years. That's great. Uh, do you have a, a favorite vacation spot? I love the beach. Getting somewhere and sitting and not doing anything, especially when I can sit at a pool looking at the beach having a cocktail. Uh, <laughs> and so anything within those parameters makes me pretty happy. Uh, I also like, love going to Paris. And then final question, uh, biggest inspiration in life. What inspires you? Um, I think the a belief that whatever, uh, let me start that over. Yep. Um, you know, Todd, I think I've always rightly or wrongly had a belief or a view that you could do anything. And, and that's not to say like, I could go to been an NBA basketball player, but that part of growing up kind of begins to teach you that there are certain ceilings or limitations around you about how you need to think about yourself or understand yourself and, there's reasons for that because you can't jump off a bed and fly as a kid, even <laughs> yeah. if you believe so, but that it's too easy. I think to, to make that a default assumption about more and more things. And it's a lot of fun to think about what could I do if I challenge that or I tried or someone else, or if a business did that. And so in, in some ways, simply the, the almost maybe boyish uh, view of, if you jump off a bed, maybe this time you will fly. Just <laughs> keep trying that, you know, don't jump off a bed again, but try something else. And I love doing that. I love helping other people do that and being a part of that process. Well, Patrick, I, I greatly appreciate you giving me a few minutes today. If someone wanted to reach out to you or reach out to, to True Digital, how would they do that? Best way would be uh, LinkedIn, uh, very active on it true digital group.com is our website patrick at true digital group.com is my email address uh would love to talk and again todd thank you for uh, having me on today in this conversation all right thank you good luck and uh hopefully we'll get you back uh, sometime in the future awesome thanks todd